tutorial is supposed to on the components of um, so I'm just opening yeah I think it's on the components of uh, the transformer model which was supposed to be yesterday but it is transformed to today um, and then later in the afternoon Ramet will give the tutorial on the advanced views of Huggy Face and then uh, maybe tomorrow uh, that Nat Nile will present on data preparation on instruction tuning components so uh, do you all receive like the, the new labeling a platform that Nat and I prepared so just to get an idea is it already shared hello Seems, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, hello. We yeah, can okay. hear you. So great, thanks. So uh, was was it shared or not? Maybe just wrote us if you are there as well. You may help me understand. Did we share the new platform or not? Okay. Um, and it, it seems. It's not shared already in the uh, Slack, so I assume maybe it's not. Um, but okay, so we will be sharing. Just looking at. Yeah, I think it seems not. Uh, so let me just check because I think that would help. I was just talking to Nat Nair and he's um, adding all the data so that um, so that's why it's not shared. Okay, good to know. But we have just prepared uh, an easy platform that you can use to label um, and just by clicking. And then if GPT has already labeled it, you can confirm. And if GPT hasn't labeled that data, whether it's a, an ad or not a platform. So it just, it will make it very simpler for many people to do it and you can ask also your friends to even help you label just um, so that that way we get enough data for that so that's the part okay so um i think there are maybe some questions uh i haven't i was just looking right now on the, all seven on week seven i think there is a question by abraham so maybe just can you ask it here abraham if you are here and then I will continue. I mean, I'm not well prepared. I was just much more on the meetings, um, but I can go, go through basically the the original transformer model and explain uh, the different components and along the way as well. You will understand, or you can ask some questions. <coughs> so, any question before that? Just I think some housekeeping, like kind of questions that are asked if abraham is here that he, you can ask and yeah abraham go on <clears throat> yeah, okay good morning, morning. Uh, morning. Uh, it wasn't actually a question uh yesterday he told us to share uh, the to record the notes and okay. share the okay. slack so that you can add uh, comments and also rectify what's wrong or uh, see how it goes that's why i shared it i wasn't able to Yesterday, I just did it today so that everyone can see. So if you could review it again and add, add on I don't. I think yeah, people can add exactly just the discussions around it. That's great. And thanks a lot, Abraham. Okay, so maybe maybe then let's start from question. If anyone has question on you know on understanding some components of the transformer, I will just go through the paper, so and then tell also a little bit of the story that connects what was before transformer and what happened what came uh, after the transformer so that you you connect the dots um and uh, so 
but is there any specific question people haven't understood uh, or people have understood and they want to explain their understanding so that it helps them later to absorb you know see the difference you know if you if you are, if you are not using git diff it's the most important tool in git in git and that's the only reason is because whenever you know the difference you can understand much better and knowledge is the same and understanding is the same just a simple don't accept a non diff knowledge it has to be a diff knowledge that means like with respect to what you have you know what what is the expected difference and if you have that understanding then you you understand better if it's just coming you don't know if it's useful or not so you know it's really so that's why i keep asking and that's my you can think of it as my way of saying anything or telling anything that i think is useful so i i need at least one or two three understandings or questions related so that we can start so from your uh, reading from your play what have you understand by transformer models what are the components the key components what are the areas that are that you understand well and what are the areas that you that it's not uh, clear anyone yeah so rudolf and then Nikes. and then okay, I'll, I'll good morning Abeba. yeah how are you morning good okay so when uh, i take the transformer architecture uh, i know that we have uh, um three Three block. We have the the position the position block, and we have the decoder block, and uh, we have also the decoder block. Now inside the inside the encoder block, we have a uh, surface. We have a uh, uh, some. We have some self attention and uh, uh, I, I don't know how the architecture in front of me. I try to <laughs> to picture what I, I have in my mind. Basically, okay. When uh, what the architecture does? Um, first of all, uh, <clears throat> it takes the yeah, thing to you. Yeah. It takes uh, uh, a, a data, the a data, where the data is, then it will tokenize the, the data. I mean, when I'm talking about the data, I'm talking about a test, a, a test data. So we tokenize that data. By tokenizing the data, uh, it, will ask, it will associate to each token a number. These, uh, these are, I was calling the, the position, uh, a block so uh, after that this one will be will be sent to uh, the the block encoder and within this block encoder we have a multi head and uh, uh, something else. but what's happened over there is that uh, the core, the core of our uh, encoder, uh, which is uh, the set of attention, will try to, will try to um, understand uh, the the meaning of uh, uh, each component within and uh, the context, and after that, uh, that it is sent to the decoder block. And the decoder block will basically, uh, I, I can't explain really what's happening over there, but basically it will decode the, the information and that's it. Briefly, this is what I can say. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I, I know I didn't say things correctly. Yeah. There are no, some it is okay. I think can... the, most, the most important part is to be able to summarize more than just getting in the details, but you know what the architecture so that's yeah so great thanks 
Uh, bir kez. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, a little bit maybe your sound is, but I can increase my volume. But if you can speak a little bit louder, better. Okay, maybe it might be yeah. mine. Yeah, uh, that's better. Okay. So uh, from the my first, I, I think I have a question. Uh, sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we should use like an approach like git diff. So I, I really like uh, that analogy. But my question is, for example, when I try to understand transformers, what I understood is that transformers had a big uh, part when it comes to uh, how uh, LLM works, and it it, it gave the it gave them a huge advantage. But I'm not sure. But there was another uh, approach that was used before transformers. So my question is, why? Let's say I don't know that that approach. I, I don't know it in detail or uh, highly so. How can I compare the two yeah. if I don't know the previous one? That's yeah. my fir my first question. Yeah. No. I I, I mean, so a diff is everywhere, right? For every oh, commit, you have a diff, and yes. similarly. It is about a diff with respect to, for example, just transformers between the previous model and the current model, but between what you think you understand and what you what is actually the case, right? So, and then today you will have one. Tomorrow there is going to be another diff if someone is explaining, right? Mm -hmm. So knowledge is not it is continuously upgrading. Your understanding of it is also really evolves based on your complexity, right? Mm -hmm. You understand today and tomorrow you understand completely you think you understand it you don't you have you it will take again and again a different realization of understanding i would say if unless a person understands something in 10 different ways they haven't yet even they they can't even explain it better so in a way it is this different knowledge connecting it with different knowledge to understand it from that perspective you know how can i understand you know, for example, what transformers are doing with respect to like, for example, humans are doing, right? You know, what are the components that seems in the transformers that people are talking? Do I understand why, for example, there are three vectors, you know? You don't have to understand even with respect to, so this deep can, can happen at all, you know, you're trying to think there's a linearity in time. No, it's like, think of them as branches, all different knowledge, and you can do diff with different branches as well as with the same branch with different timestamp and things like that. So it is really the organization of knowledge is very, very much like you have different branches evolving in different ways, both the technical and technical, you know, the IT and then IT and all that component. And it is trying to ask questions to yourself like, OK, you know, what what do I understand? You know, what are the things that I feel uncomfortable? You know, that's a diff over your understanding. So I would say much more follow that approach, just trying to converse with yourself and ask that diff with respect to either the knowledge that you have, like for example, if you know sequence to sequence, you can diff with that. But if you don't know, just you can say like, okay, you know, I am trying to understand self attention and I don't know, probably I read something about attention or I think they are doing this, you know, can I, take with respect so someone should tell me to help me be, you know a better version of that or something i can query it or i can ask it in a certain way that i'm tr i'm feeling it that way even if i don't have any idea i feel it's doing this way is this correct or you know should i completely me did i understand it completely wrong so searching to find a reference is what i mean by this like and that that can be anywhere you know with respect to the same if you are expert with respect to the previous knowledge you have, if you're not expert with respect to the feeling that you have, and with respect to another knowledge that you have related, you know, with respect to how you human work as well in this case. So it can be anything. I don't know if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes, it does. So when we come to today's topic, yeah. uh, uh, main the main thing that I understood from the transformers is the self attention part. So. Okay. What, what I wrote in my notice, self-attention allow a neural network to understand the word in a context of a word around it. That's uh, to give an example. Let's say if uh, I have a text that say, server, can I have the check? Which means I'm referring to the waiter. In the second one, look like I just crashed the server. So the server had different meaning. So self-attention allows it to understand in a context of the surrounding words. So 
for the first uh, text, it can understand that it's talking about a person. And for the second one, it can understand that it's talking about the actual the server we use in IT. So based on the words that surround it, uh, and the other uh, parties, I'm hoping to get information, more information about them, like the positional encoding and the encoder decoder. Uh, that's where uh, I'm looking uh, for help. Yeah, okay. So I, I think yeah, we'll talk about that. So that's good. Abdulhaman? Yeah, so hello. Behind. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I just lost uh, lost connection for a couple of minutes. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, I just needed a, a clarification about the, uh, the importance of the We we'll, we lost you again, Abdraman. Uh, Pre-processing the data. Okay, so we we, lo we lost you, Abdraman. So can uh, you say it again? Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I just uh, asking about uh, the importance about about the uh, pre-processing data, uh, importance of these steps and labeling the data. If uh, you can uh, give me a brief uh, clarification or something. Yeah. Okay. So it's so for example, some of the differences come <clears throat> on like a very simple. Sometimes another way to think about data quality is you know, take the extreme cases where it is the data is high quality where it means every single piece is checked and it is from writers that really knows the language and it is diverse that it is basically you know different use of the language whether it's in the formal setting informal setting legal setting as well as also entertainment setting and every other thing you can think of is included in the data in that sense basically just like a human if you th or i think you can you can actually think of it I and mean, it just came to me now. You can think of it the difference between different schools. You know, the difference between different schools is that in some schools they use they basically have teachers that knows the subjects well and that knows the curriculum well, and they basically teach kids. And then the kids in you know with the same capacity, they learn much, much, much more. In another school where the teachers are not that you know well informed or they are not disciplined or they are not you know basically uh, into teaching you can think of they still maybe are showing the you know they're displaying you know the curriculum the, the books are the kids have the books and they also write in in the class what you know what the from the book they they actually use it but you know that they are not going to be performing well so the quality of data, therefore, in that sense, you really can think of it, it's so different. With one year of learning, a kid in a good school versus a kid in a not good school basically becomes that difference, right? So the kid in, in, a, in a good school might know how to compute, you know, uh, additions, multiplications, they, they know how to read, and they know basically different things, while the kid in a not good school, probably they just keep the class, I mean, they basically, may pass the class, but they don't have that much understanding. So the quality of the data is that one. If you really think even the extreme, the other side, if the data is basically not in Amharic, you know, like if you are giving it Amharic, for example, and the Amharic is actually just some rubbish, that means it is written, you know, randomly by, you know, some random generator. Basically, the language structure is not there. And therefore, however, the size of the data, the Basically, the network doesn't learn. So that part is one. And the other part is what you said by labeling. So a labeled data means it is very specifically told, you know, what it's not only, it, it's, it's not asked to only figure out what it needs to do itself. So you can imagine if I give you a time, so here is a, a, a mobile phone, I want you to fix it, right? And I don't tell you, what actually the problem is then you really have to figure out you you will spend more time figuring out the problem than solving it 
The other one, and of course that's nice, for example, doctors sometimes help by that. If you tell them, you know, oh, my pain is on my chest, uh, the doctors will start then asking around the chest. And if actually your chest, your pain is actually in your leg, you know, you, of course, if the labeling is wrong, then that means you really mislead the doctor. So the doctor might then prescribe some medicine and, you know, it's not correct, right? So if the labeling is wrong, sometimes it's better to, to use unlabeled so that you ask the doctor actually to figure out what, you know, what is your, you know, the pain by just going through it. We, the doctor will spend more time actually going through your, you know, to figure out, but at least sometimes it's better. So the quality of labeling and unlabeling is like that. It saves time, not only save time, it actually instructs the network to actually learn more in a, in a faster and smaller data. So a labeled small data is much more than, for example, unlabeled many data, right? So that because if the quality of the labeling is good, but the, the you know label is expensive to, you know, to know labeling, you know, to do data labeling is expensive. So I hope that explains that addresses your the why the need for the quality of the the data as well as the labeling. Uh, it was breaking, but I think I get uh, the picture. Okay, good. Okay, Kerod. Um, I just uh, I just thought you were asking about uh, today's session, just to, to talk about today's session. So yes, no, I, I, just, I no, no. I mean, I, I I was even if the other one was um, decreasing, but it, I thought it was a good question as well, so that's why I answered. But yeah, it's about transformers. Okay, so from uh, my research uh, uh, about transformers and self-attention me mechanisms. So self-attention mechanism is just a mechanism that uh, calculates the probability of uh, which word is going to come next, depending on the context or the words that came before it. So uh, if we say hi, how are, and so the next word is going to be most probably going to be you. So that's how it works, uh, the self-mechanism and the transformer. Uh, it has uh, three architectures, the encoder, encoder, decoder, and decoder only uh, architectures. So the encoder only is mo mostly used for q and and self-name uh, de detection uh, uh, applications. Uh, it's just trained on a pre trait uh, of or art or a bidirectional context. And the uh, encoder decoder is trained on a, uh, so it's also trained on a bi-directional context, but the encoder receives as input and the decoder gives output. So the, I think the, and the, the final is the decoder. So the, the decoder is uh, what we know as uh, chat GPT and other chats that are able to, you know, uh, to talk to us like humans, like it's uh, text-based architectures. I think, yeah, yeah, that's what oh. I have for now. Good, good. Yvonne? So, from my understanding of the transformers and encoders and decoders is that there can be LLMs which are encoder only, and then there can be LLMs which are decoder only. So, encoder only LLMs include LLMs like BAT, which are bidirectional. They they, they, they just focus on understanding the context of the data. They do not focus on generating the data. And then decoder only focus on generating the data and they do not focus on understanding the context. Now I have a question from what I have understood. So yeah. if GPT, let's say GPT, GPT is a decoder only, right? It's generative. If GPT focuses on only generating data how does it understand the context because sometimes you give it something and it gives you back with a context that is well understood but it is not focused on understanding the context do you get my very, question very very good question it's the yes. most important question i will okay. come to it great okay <clears throat> i think you know all of them are good and the only difference i would say is that they are high level. <clears throat> By high level, what I mean is that it doesn't talk. If you look at the paper, this is the very first paper that introduced it. 
um, you know, it's small, it's very short, um, and it introduces what was, uh, Mikes, what you were saying, you know, what was before it. What was before it was, of course, based on recurrent neural networks, based on uh, LSTM, you know, or just gated recurrent, all of that were there. And then that's called sometimes sequence to sequence. And and if you look, there is an, uh, I have, I think I should share, uh, maybe I should share, stop presenting, maybe the whole window is better. So what I am going to do that now is, so here is, for example, one paper on, on sequence to sequence that was before. Um, and I think it's a lot more mathematics related. So some of you probably would, of course, understand it. Some of you might not. But <clears throat> so the very innovation of this paper and is, of course, if you know it, would have been with respect to what was before it. What was before it, um, maybe just let's find, I think, one um, that actually explains Uh, no, this, no, this is also not, maybe that I don't have it open. Ah, yeah, I, no, this is not also. Okay, so, so basically it is what, what a recurrent neural network or what sequence to sequence was doing is that it basically doesn't have any, um, uh, it, it is embedding, it, it's working on latent space. Um, I think there must be somewhere. Unfortunately, I didn't open, but let me just find one. Um, mates, maybe. Yeah, okay. So I think this is the type. Uh, so if you see my screen. So sequence to sequence, what they were doing is that they had, um, you know, there is of course a timestamp. So it's a, a sequence. So that means it's, you are giving it. And for each of those sequence, it would of course embed. And then the embedded ones, which embedding by now, you know, but the embedded ones will then be given to the encoder. Now the encoder encodes and, and puts, uh, so mostly it's used in machine translation or other tasks then it would have basically a big vector um, that represents what is called context. So there would be, you know, the context of that one. And it's just a transformation of whatever that token, embedded token, is then transformed, applied some weight, and goes to the first state. And the first state is passed then to the second state. And it goes on and it goes on. And basically, at each step, it, there is what, what the next one is receiving uh, is the embedding ones, as well as from the previous token, the basically the context, what, what is called a context vector, right? And it does that, it does that, and this is much more encoding the whole process. So it relates in one, in one part, it relates, but the second part, it also knows, learns about the previous, uh, whatever was in the previous um, from basically because it has a context and then using that context of the previous uh, token and the token it is also embedding, then it puts it in the same vector, in, in, same, in some uh, transformed vector, which is called another context, and then pass it that context to this one. Again, it does that and it does that. And uh, basically the decoder then starts receiving that and then it does itself kind of outputting, predicting what is, what is coming. So because now, the difference between encoder and decoder in this is that the encoder encodes all of the inputs and then, you know, whatever is transformed, whatever is expected will be, it's not, as you can see, it's not a one word prediction. It is actually gets all the context through a latent space combined with the, you know, the embedding, uh, the token at its head position. And then the decoder has now one context vector that summarizes all of the the kind of inputs, 
and then it starts outputting. So in machine translation, you can say, or in in a in a in a kind of question and answer case, as you can see, you give it how are you, and that is encoded in the encoder part, and then the decoder starts actually like the first encoder outputs the first one and passes that context again to the second one. Then the second one does that, does that, does that, you know? So in the decoder as well, the output, not only the context, the output of the decoder also is given to the next state. So that was a sequence to sequence. And you know, the main challenge for this was it's not parallelized. It, it really cannot scale as much because as you can see, you know, you have to wait uh, and you cannot run in parallel many of the things and and this is what was the the kind of the one of the problem for um recurrent neural network way or ls based models okay so they summarize that part here and you can see you know they motivate just in the introduction why the challenge associated to the recurrent model and then they also of course they give the background you know how people were trying to address uh, these issues and then basically that they introduced their model that solves this problem so and it's a, you know the most of course as you know now it's the most revolutionary paper um because first it allows because of its construction it doesn't need it it decouples the embedding part and um so you can whether it's just only you focus on on, on one part um, it basically, you can have this completely parallelized because these are different blocks. And, and then, of course, what is inside them is what makes it, you know, what is really the innovation here is the, the self-attention. Attention, attention um, was also there actually before. Like, so if we look here, so now if you sequence to sequence attention, so there was actually a more, yeah, I think this is a better one. So there was actually other people that are present, Bernardo in 2014, 2014, they actually, so the main issue with respect to just sequence to sequence was there was only one vector that the context vector. So if it is a 256 um, dimension, so there is only that. Now, whether you are using a long sentence, or a short sentence, it doesn't understand, right? So, and it is usually like having the, you know, the, the sentence structure being very different sometimes what you give it and having only one single vector representing the context was the issue. And therefore what they wanted was that, okay, why not introduce um, a new, what, what is called, I mean, exactly attention there and attention here is the same, but now the only difference is the, uh, the the definition. So as you can see, so what attention is stating that, so the encoder states for token K, so you have that, and the, the decoder states at uh, step T receives actually, you know, they are combined and they are given a score. And that is passed actually then back to the decoder stage, right? So it's basically, as you can see, each of them, they get soft maxed. And because before, in the sequence to sequence only, it was going only, as you saw, only linear. There was no, basically, the decoder doesn't know the tokens that were, that were, you know, the context of the first token. It must pass through some, what is called abstract context vector that is represented because one was passing to the other and there is some transformation. We assume the context is somehow in that one and then pass to that one, pass to that one. So the, the decoder was only be able to see the last part so and then they said oh instead of that why not while encoding why not we form some score uh, that goes into some transformation each of the contexts are actually then being soft maxed and then their weight is then um you know this is their weight and then you form then one basically um one uh score or one uh, one other context that combines all the context and then give it feed it actually to basically to the decoder so that is what was called attention and so because it was it, it helps it focus as you can see given uh, sometimes like the weights are for some of them for some tokens are much more 
so that the decoder can make a lot of attention um, for that one because this is a weight vector. I know I am saying a lot of stuff and you might not, you don't need to understand much, but if you have question, you can also ask. So, so this was what was before and attention was, became really, really solved a lot of, um, a, a lot of stuff. Like it, it basically improved so much um, the sequence to sequence model. And the only, the only thing that was remaining, of course, was the, that the parallelization still is in this recurrent neural network type or LS10 type or get like, you know, these types. And so that was the issue. So you don't have to understand, but if you at least are not confused, then it's fine. If you're confused, ask. So then, you know, um, so just put your hand so that I can hear them um, if you have questions. So I will continue normally. So their structure, as I said, is of course attention, but they, it's not just only attention, it's called self-attention. And then of course that's parallelized to be multi-head attention. So let's talk about that this what they call um, a scaled dot product attention. So the very, very sense of actually then attention, which is coming right there, right after encoding, as you can see. So here is, I will talk about also positional encoding and uh, you know, this, this part, which is let's, let's for now, let's call it positional in embedding because encoding is something else, embedding is something else. So don't, don't get confused sometimes people would say positional encoding or positional embedding. Positional encoding is just nothing. It has no data. It's much more a structure, a counter, while positional embedding is the combination of them. So um, that one. But as immediately after uh, this positional embedding, what is there is just, of course, self-attention or multi-head uh, multi attention. So we have to understand what does, what does that block means. What that block is actually doing is very interesting. That is another innovation that really allows parallelization. Before this, so it draws three vectors. They are called query, key, and value. And as you can see, they, they're nothing. They're basically some transformed component of the input embedding. So let's call this one, as I said, positional embedding or the input, the inputs. So this input is basically is passed, right? So here, whatever, network we have in the embedding is what we call the embedding layer so next when you want to embed something for example chat gpt uh, or gpt in general open ai you have the embedding um, op, uh, so when you embed something it is this layer that is trained of course together but this layer alone the output of this layer is called embedding okay so it's just they, you know, in hugging face, you can actually specify the embedder, just uh, get out of the embedder. And like, I think there's just, I uh, have, um, so I think maybe just here, and there might be embedding in one of them. Um, okay, maybe just not here, but so you, you have like basically just a way to extract exactly just specifically embedding it's not here but so the embedding part is just basically together it will be trained and then this component of it uh, becomes the embedder and then the other part together with the embedding and in, in the forward basically becomes the um so becomes the output so the prediction the, so the inference basically becomes like it it embeds if you give it and then it goes as well to just predicting the thing and then it, in a loop it starts predicting so that's the part okay so there is a question so let's um who is there a question so hand was there a hand okay oh no it's a text okay uh uh so it is basically like uh, attention plus in style of processing. Uh, yes, it is in, in part, but the, the difference is very how this W, so basically the Q, which is the query, and K, which is the key and value. So, <coughs> sorry, to understand what, you know, this is a, basically a matrix, multiple, you know, a projection, they call it a projection means normally, if you know linear algebra, 
in linear algebra, a, a, a vector, something Q, can be written by the input is X, for example, X vector. And then there is a matrix called usually A. So, for example, um, Y vector is equal to A vector, which is basically a you know, some uh, operator, and then uh, the X vector. So in the X vector, normally that X is input, and the, the weight in this case is uh, what we call A, but in our in, in, in the matrix sense, it's a matrix, nor in in LLMs or like in deep learning sense, all of those matrix are called weights. So that's basically some weight that is being trained, and then that project. So the weight that projects the input into Q is called WQ, and uh, you know the, the one K is called WK, and then other one is wv so every time it's written like you know uh, this is how it's written qw uh, kw and vw so these are basically some um, you know these are w's are the weights and q's are the vectors so uh, it's not to give you the mathematical part of it but the most important part is that so this is the key so the the real the real part of it is the first is that projection and what do they do what, what is their meaning? So in the attention sense, we said, you know, the, the different um, inputs are combined um, to form an attention. Here is also very similar. It's very similar to attention because the, but instead of, for each token, we have now actually a, a QKV um, operator. So instead of just its token alone, it is actually projected into three components. And this, if you really, really want to understand, I mean, you can ask me, but the, the very key component of the meaning of them is much more of think of it earlier, the server, um, the example that M Mikias gave. So server in part, like, you know, think of it as from information retrieval perspective. If you know information retrieval, some of you might not be from IT, so I understand. But information retrieval, go to YouTube. That's another information retrieval. You want to type a query. So you query something, a music name, you know, um, some um, Kenyan cuisine. Now, this is the query part. And the key part is what the system is basically searching for. Normally, it will not search for the, the video content, but normally there is for each video, there is a key component, which is their title and their description, right? So that is the key component. So it then goes and your query uh, is kind of, is called dot producted with the key. So there are many keys and then each keys are for different videos. And then your query is now multiplied with the, the, the key that is stored in the database. And then, so that part, the one that is matched is actually then uh, fetched. So the value basically is, the value of the video and basically the video component is v in this case and the video is now uh, outputted to you so this process is very similar the query and the k this k are again as all the tokens that are out there so q is just the the part that we are focusing we are computing attention for and k is all the k's that are out there because the k is in the database therefore it's just all the sequences and they get multiplied scaled masked if necessary and soft maxed and these are basically different op operators soft max is basically some um you know thresholding such that it doesn't explode and then once the right thing is found again this is a weight thing so it's you know you can't think of it as just youtube probably offers you a list of videos therefore just similar you know this v is a list of videos so it's not just an actual one single video that is fetched but a set of videos are, 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 are matched and then multiplied together. So Q is the attention that we are putting and K is the keys that, you know, it represents some form of key. In this case, key, you know, you can really interpret it. A word can have multiple meaning. Therefore, that's why K is necessary because a word can have a semantic and syntactic. So for example, uh, you know, get me, you know, I am, uh, I will get food versus I will, you know, uh, I will have to, you know, I will um, get me, uh, I need to get serious. So in these two cases, get is, for example, has two different meaning. So you can think of it, the meaning, the actual meaning to be value, while the gate part is 
for example, the key. So that's why it's necessary in, in a, and there are many reasons, I'm just giving you a hand-waving argument, why you need to decompose even a sentence into key and value such that you store it, you store different meanings, you know, the actual word of it versus the meaning of it separately. So this, the meaning of key KV is exactly those components. Once you have them, you multiply them, and then, you know, then you do all sorts of operations to them. Um, so this is basically the, the dots, the scale dot attention. So there is some linear operator applied to them, and then you concatenate when it's a multi-head. So, and so basically multi-head means the same attention, but you now have for each W, for, you know, for each V, you have multiple Vs. Um, that are out there, like that actually combines these things, and then you basically concat them and linear at them. So multi head is really basically you you get multiple Q, multiple VQ case uh, from the same token, so that it not only represents uh, one thing, but it has a much more broader understanding um, of relationships. So that's basically the multi head. So now we got to the point where okay, the multi head is explained, hopefully hopefully that you now know why this projection of from the input embedding why we did we, we created for each token so these are for each token we created a three vectors that actually um represent one is you know the the attention of for that vector it's computed the other ones would represent would be used again of course to compute um this scale dots product attention okay so then attention as defined here is therefore, as you can see, it is the, the Q and K are dot producted and then soft maxed and then multiplied by V. And this basically becomes attention. Attention to what? Of course, attention to, this is of course a very matrix, high dimensional matrix, but it's mostly for the Q part. So that means it, for the QI, this is basically computed as the attention for that, for that um, query vector basically, or for that token, okay? And then scaled um, part, okay? So multi-head is basically just attention concatenated with um, different heads. So each of heads being one attention, and basically the multi-head means just the concatenated version of each of this attention. So as I said, different queues and different Ws. And, but normally that the projector is what is important, therefore that's why the eyes are representing the projectors or the, the ones that combine or that that form um, that that is used to compute the attention part. So, okay. I know that I am hand waving, but it's at least will help you to understand um, um, as you read or as you understand later when people say, you know, uh, you don't have to understand for your current task. So it's much more of, uh, to be able to explain what are the components and you can say, you know, in the attention, we have that projections, Q, query, uh, key and value, and they represent for each word. And then later you will realize those are the, the very senses that makes also attention better um, um, part. So the positional embedding, the positional encoding was necessary as it's written also on the, uh, here, it's actually in a normal uh, recurrent neural network, you have the sequence itself. Therefore, the positions of the sequences are actually represented in that part. Here, we don't have that. So as you can see, as you can see in the structure, everything is fed to basically it's embedded and then fed. And then there is this, you, you compute this and then you, know, you do some uh, feed forward and normalizations and additions. There's nothing that is sequence that, that keeps the, the sequence and we know it's very important, the sequence of words. Not only their tokens and structures, which is important, but also the sequences are very important. How, you know, sequences means, because every token here are translated into basically tokens. So, you know, every input, every text is translated into tokens. Tokens are basically, uh, have names. In this case, as you can see, you know, the tokenization component, it translates words into, uh, basically integer that integer is basically the from your dictionary the index in your dictionary basically if if that you you think of the your dictionary being uh, one word per page so basically 
which page it is will tell you that basically that's what the info you know that the tokenization part means it gives you the token id in the vocabulary in the book of that vocabulary and therefore it doesn't really um you know and, and how you store it's like it doesn't matter like the current structure is not kept so the structure of um, uh, your sentence is not stored because each token is coming separately and then you have a collection of ids there is nothing that tells you about the structure um or you know it, it, you will lose the structure the sequence structure once you get here because everything is you know now um, will be translated or projected into qkv uh, and then it's gonna be like computed into a matrix so there isn't any structure on 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 that part so the positional encoder what it does is of course normally we would have liked you know the the, the very first you know simple projections i think i'm just gonna because this one has a much more better i have shared it as well this one and to the uh i think here on in the reference uh, this one so here it's on the positional embedding uh, or it's so here embedding i shared as well this one uh, understanding positional embedding uh, so this one you can find it there as well but so very you know you have these tokens and then the very simple um position counting would be to really put all the tokens and give them the position you know that, that's it it's like you now have a position so you basically later it, it satisfies there are a number of things it needs to be satisfied it, it satisfies it's linear when you take you know position means when you do some difference because gradients means differences and when you take differences you get the right thing because yeah three minus two you know you get one so that's fine five minus three you get two so it's it's good like you, you can do some differences so this should have this should have been fine we could have used this one as a positional encoder um and 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 you know basically then multiply it with with the embedding and we would have kept the weights associated to the positions that way but the problem with deep learning i think that now this begs a very important question in, in deep learning nothing we don't want anything to be big numbers everything should be around zero and just an equal negative and equal positive without if it's not the case then there is lots of problems that you will encounter when you train because you're taking differences you know they either explode huge like for example like that they would either explode very much or they would basically die decay so it's a very um very the essence of deep learning is because you are back propagating and training and that one needs some gradient so you really want a stable a stable nature and normally you want it between minus one and one everything should be that's why it's being normalized everything should be uh, between minus one and one so the second component of course is because we can't use now you know we can't use just a simple okay this token is at this position this token is at this position because we can't do that um then we have to try something let's let's normalize it okay you know take the very big number and then normalize it now you get that one but that's not enough because now you really want a uh, disposition of the you know the basically the token number the token by position it means that the, the token number the token number now cannot be uh for now if you think of now after you normalize if you think the sequence has the sequence the text that you provide the same things you have if it has 10 um 10 strings or 10 words then of course what 0 point you know 5 for 10 words is very different what 0 0.5 for three words of sentence so that means two sentences just because they are now in you know have different lengths the the position of the token will will be different so even if the token which is called i am here versus uh, i was going blah 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 and then i am here so the i part now will not have the same value in the one will have 
you know, 0 0.5, you know, zero, may, maybe zero, and the other one will have like some other number. So this fails because we want to keep, just because this is a dictionary and the page must not, you know, the page number must not be changed depending on uh, the size of the context or the size of the string. So this fails, okay. And you know, and this person really nice. Okay, the other way, given that now we can't embed it this way, we could do some binary and a binary representation. And we can represent each of them now by, you know, by kind of like a binary number. And um, I think you will realize, so there is a very nice thing. When you do a binary difference, it's very, very, you know, complex. So for example, if it was just like the first one, so this one um, where you are actually normalizing, then you get linear in one dimension, which is great. And then you, you can take differences. But in binary, you cannot take differences of the, the vectors of the matrix. Because you can see, you know, the first token will happen here. The second token will be there. The second, so there's no linearity in it. And it's very hard. So, you know, that's why it goes into, you know, the usual way that we know which is something binary and which uh, we can decompose it. Uh, we, we need something continuous, but at the same time, we need to represent a vector that is usually called sine and cosine, the trigonometries. And in the trigonometry, you can basically, each position of the, the position basically can be another vector, just like the vector, what we saw like the, like the binary vector, just like binary vector, it can have a, a binary, like some values, and then, uh, each of the values basically can represent, um, so I am now not explaining well, uh, so you should ask me, that the i vector is basically the index of the, the token, and then the 2 pi over 2j, which is can be sometimes as a frequency in, in trigonometry, basically can be used as uh, basically the frequency. So that means you now have this thing, which is, of course, uh, counting, is multiplied by this and you can construct mij and you can see from this plot this will give you for every position some continuous uh, continuous that means that you can take derivatives some continuous vector that you can use as position so the only you know so all of this that i am putting everything is to come to this point it is the problem of this position is we can't use one to three and the next, our idea of normalizing cannot work. The second, which we binarize, cannot work because we cannot take the difference. And therefore, the science and conscience are usually the usual way to encode when you have this kind of things, right? So by, because science and conscience, they have, you know, at each part, the position will ultimately give you the, you know, like the shift and then the frequency, the actual, you know, this is called the position becomes the phase and the other, the, the one over of this, you can think of it as frequency, basically is the wavelengths or the frequency of that wave. And when you decompose it into this, it basically becomes, um, you know, very translatable. It satisfies all the conditions. So I am, again, this is not, you don't have to understand everything, but you can now know why you, you couldn't just use one, two, three, like the way that normally when you do uh, tokenization, what you get is one, two, three, whatever, because it's basically, you know, it's fine for you. But as soon as you, you take, you put that thing into the network, into a deep learning, you basically have to do something different, complex, such that it does, it's not one, two, three, but it is something more. It is something like, you know, continuous between minus and one. And, and basically this satisfies that. That's why they didn't spend that much time here because they thought, you know, people should figure out the maths. Okay. So that one, um, the, the, the position of the, so basically the, the tokenization uh, and their position that is in the embedding part. So the embedding is a different, the embedding is a network that embeds those tokens uh, where they are, the semantic component, while the position part is basically that translates the tokens, um, uh, positions or that basically the, the tokens value or the, the tokens, uh, the tokenization components, the, the one that translates from the vocabulary index. Basically, it's a mapping of the vocabulary index. 
I think from here on, I think this should be fine. Um, let me then, you know, see if there are questions and if I answer some of your questions or if I confuse you so much that now you think that you don't understand anything. So where are we? It's silence, usually not good. So in simple terminologies that I can now summarize these components, the rest you are doing the computation, the fine tuning. Transformers solve the very, very, very essential problem. One is giving us, of course, because of their decomposition, uh, it allows us to capture a lot more of the complexities of language. Second is because they now make it, they don't use sequences like recurrent neural network that cannot be parallelized. They now use just a simple network. They can be trained in multi-heads, for example, in different processes, they can be computed and concatenated. And, and these different layers are basically, um, can be parallelized because they're all just uh, simple. No, no one is expecting from the previous step in that sense, across each layer you can compute it uh, differently you know like in parallel so they allow a much bigger and wider network to be trained in billions of you know weights and um and their position like the the they solve the problem of uh, tokenization or embedding the sequence the tokens numbers the vocabulary using the positional encoding and the combination of those two allows basically you know a good uh, a good encoder or embedding space the positional uh, um, the position and the actual weights combined they give you actually a much you know a, a very good embedding space so that's that's if you take anything just take it like that that's the summary and if you hear any time positional encoding you know now it's really it represents it's the token the token numbers because we can't give them as one to three it's a way of providing one to three in a in a way that the deep learning understands that's that's it okay so Mikias, does it does that answer your question about positional encoding and and all that i think i have a pretty good idea well, on doing more research I think absolutely. yeah David okay helps. Yeah, and Yvonne, now your question, which is the, really a hard question, you really need to understand what in-context learning is. So normally, you know, finding a vocabulary for your question is useful. So what is called is in-context learning. Okay, so in the in-context learning, so that basically means that was the innovation that, of course, GPT has as well. We knew we can predict the we can predict the next word and the next word because it's it looks all the history uh, to predict the next word because you know as you as you can see uh, in the network so these self attentions basically you know will will look into all of the sequences and then they basically capture that even in the inference of course the model runs with those weights you know whatever it was that and then it, it was predicting and the learning component for the embedding is that you know you give everything up to that point and then you are predicting the next one the output probability so that means for example if you are giving it i am now i and am are the inputs to the encoder to the decoder and those are the, the full sentence so they are translated into qkv and then every part is now, you know, the positional embedding, blah, blah, would be there. And then uh, it will compute the probability for the token. You know, what should be the next token? And this is basically the, the it will go and select from the, the, the vocabulary, from the tokens that it has, right? So this will give you, because it's, the, you know, that this encoding gave you now a zero to, uh, uh, between minus one and one, Right. So now, which 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 token you are gonna show depends on the probabilities here, and you know these probabilities actually are probabilities across all of the tokens that you have because you know 
you have this embedding space that in, that basically embeds all the you know it's basically these probabilities are on which index you know for each of the embedding it's a probability for each of the embedding and when you threshold it and soft max it what happens is exactly that you get which token to show next so now but which tokens to show next given the position and encoder given this is actually like based on the sequence you gave it so the, the context you gave it it actually learns from that class the weights and it selects the, the right word or some probabilities with that so why it's learning is that because this kqv decomposition and you know looking into each pieces and no and through the learning while it was learning it actually learned how the vocabularies combine each other so the way it's, you can think of it as the probabilities of you know the um, the different the vocabularies and therefore these probabilities are basically allowing you to select if, while looking at the past data which means the context and it it selects the highest probability of the token that comes next so it's basically because it's generating token so um, i i know that uh, sometimes this kind of explanation without a board is hard so you won't you have to tell me if you understand or if it's doesn't make sense yeah go on go on Yvonne. it has actually made a bit of sense so it checks the token based on the probability that is what you have said right yes. so so look at think of the embedding space to be to contain all everything in the in everything in the vocabulary will be embedded by a certain uh dimension whether it's so, uh, eight eight thousand dimension or hundred thousand dimension or four four thousand ninety six so you have an embedding space and so, that embedding okay. space it will contain all the vocabularies will be will will be one vector there right so they are basically one vector there now if you are predicting that you know the probabilities of these values basically the probability shows you know you know where is going to be one or more likely then you will select that vocabulary so it's so, basically the final output is based on the input you gave it it computes probabilities of which token it could be because the embedding space as i said contains all the vocabularies okay okay so let me give this example and then you tell me if i am right and if i have understood so let's say we have like 10 tokens and then the first token has a probability of 0 0.98 the second token has a probability of 0 0.78 the third token has a probability of 0 0.88 it will select the one with 0 0.98 because it is it has the highest probability exactly have i understood is that yeah. what you you have exactly explained that. yeah that's okay. exactly okay. that so so the output is basically the probabilities of or all the tokens right and yes yes so it's basically then you select you order it and um yeah so and how you get there is just that matrix multiplication across you know and um, and then the relationship between tokens are learned during the training okay 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 so that means if a, gen a gpt or a generative or a decoder has doesn't incorporate the in the context learning or okay the in your voice goes learning. down sorry so that means if an llm or a gpt doesn't incorporate the in context learning it will not be able to tell the context it will just be dumb yeah, okay. of course. That's why if it hasn't seen anything of that relationship, it will just be like predicting one some probability. That's why it's probability. That's why you need to check the log probability whenever it's prediction. Uh, OpenAI, for example, gives you the log probabilities of the tokens. You know, okay. and and yes. therefore you have to check whether actually it's confident or not. Confident means it has seen something like that and the correlations between the predicted token and the uh, um, the other one, like the context, is actually high. So if it's low confidence, means it hasn't seen that kind of structure. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. You have had, you have answered me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
good. Uh, so I I hope that then people have a better like a little bit down like it, it still is you know you have to understand what is of course uh, to understand everything how these are being computed you know what are how do parallelization happens I didn't talk about that but you can you know this is much more at least you can have just beyond a simple okay you know we have multi heads and there are the simple examples that are given you can actually explain. Now the end to end, why, what is, you know, where are the innovations and what makes, um, you know, this decomposition, especially the QKV is a very important decomposition because it's, it allows also uh, unsupervised training because you don't, you know, you just decompose and it's self-attention means because the sequence is decomposed into KQV and then K of something is multiplied by Q and then you know, then the V is multiplied. So you can see there is nothing label that you need, right? There is no for your um, going backward and in, in, in when you are doing some backward propagation, all you need is because the next word you know, and you compute the probability of the next word and that's it. You know? um, so this already now gives you a very good idea that the decomposition the key, whatever, is related to a different concept that we know in retrieval. And um, and that is, it captures K, especially the key part captures some kind of, if words can have different semantics uh, depending on their entry, even if their position, so their position hasn't changed. <clears throat> gate is gate, you know, the, the, the position where they are doesn't change. But K, so the value that means doesn't change. The value is basically that. But K represents its semantics. It's therefore it allows it to be very, very good. Uh, it, it computes correlations much more than the usual sequence to sequence. With that, I will leave you. And I, I hope that you have, at least you can explain something like, you know, beyond just giving example where the innovation, where things are and how it works uh, is different. And the encoder, like just one part, if you want to use the encoder part and the decoder, this is basically what they use for machine translation. You can say, you can put in the encoder, the let's say the Amharic part to translate and the um, outputs the, here you can give actually the English version and, and the cross, this is called cross attention. And that part will give you again, the encoder just outputs the, the next word at each of these tokens as they shifted because this is the shift right component that basically allows one word one token at a time you shift and therefore these outputs are the one token that are uh, shifted so this basically gives you machine translation or any other thing that is called um that is called um you know any task you know you give it it's called text to text so there is one that then that revolutionized it's called the t5 which was in 2021 20, 20, again, Google came with, with um, the part which is now with this encoder and decoder, you can do every task, any type of task you can give it and you can embed. Um, so basically you can translate that. So, you know, you give it some task and this outputs and that allows you to do any type of task. So any of the generalization, you don't need then you know, one before that, people were training one task at a time, either classification or summarization differently, and that. But this allowed actually you can do text to text, which is T5. That's why it's T5 is called, uh, you know, in text to text, um, you, you, you find five T's. And the T5 basically allows that multiple instructions in the same network can be trained. Therefore, any text to text task can be done with uh, transformers and from that of course you know gpts and all that okay so let's stop there and um yeah